please welcome uh, Ruth Ikega on the stage. Give it up for Ruth. Hi, everybody. So, uh, welcome to Open Source Community Festival. So, um, like the host said, um, if you are a beginner, today is going to be a lucky day because I'm going to be taking you through how to create an open source project. And in short, it's for everyone. Today is your lucky day because we are going to be learning and then we are also going to be creating an open source project. So how many of you are with your laptops? It's a workshop. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so the person that with their laptops, how many of you have a GitHub account? Hmm. Okay. So yeah, I'm not ready. Okay, so I'm um, Ruth Ikega. I'm an open source advocate, I'm a technical writer, and I'm also a GitHub star. And I'm going to be taking you through how you can create your own open source project. So we are in Open Source Community Festival Africa, right? And it's about open source. And we are going to be creating a project. So I'm going to be demoing it um, as many as can follow me along. You can follow me as well and take note of the steps. So the workshop will cover, we'll talk about what open source is, you know, the importance of open source, and then we'll do like hands-on for the persons that have their laptop here, the lucky persons that have their laptop here. So what is an open source project? So an open source project is, or software, is a project that the code is publicly available, right? It's, made, it's publicly available for you to assess it, to modify, to redistribute, and also to contribute to it. So that's what an open source project is. So take note of the words, assess the code, remodify, redistribute, and contribute. So we have like four words, right? Um, so let's use an example to like, you know, drive home the point. So we are going to be using two examples, operating systems. How many of you know the Windows OS? Okay, cool. Um, how many of you know the Linux OS, the Linux operating system? Okay, I'm still explaining that. So um, the Windows OS is an operating system for, you know, HP laptops, in case you do not know. Then for the Linux OS, it's also an operating system. So we are going to be using those two examples to explain, to drive home the point of open source. So now we have Windows OS, right? And then we have um, the Linux OS. So for the Windows operating system, um, it's free, right? You can install it. Um, I think there are some subscription models that like get other features um, to use it, but it's free. But then for the um, Windows operating system, you cannot see the code, right? You can't, you don't know how Windows was made. If, you know, no matter how technical you are, except you are in Microsoft or you work in Microsoft, right? You don't know, you can't see how Windows um, code, you know, how, what made the operating system and all that stuff. You can see that. But now, and you can contribute to it as well. Although op Microsoft has like open source projects, yes, but you can contribute directly to the Windows operating system. So we are done with um, the Windows operating system, right? So let's move to Linux operating system. Now, Linux operating system is an open source software. And for the Linux operating system, you can, you, are, you, are, you can see the code, you can assess the code, you can contribute to it. Linux also has like a foundation as well. You can redistribute it. Now, if you're familiar with the Linux OS, you would know that there are different distros, right? There's you know, Android, there's um, Kali Linux, there's uh, Mint, there are so many of them. So those are redistributions that, you know, when um, the founder of, or the owner of like Linux OS, um, you know, Stovall created it, some persons were able to remodify it and make it look different from the Linux, the original Linux OS. So I hope I've been able to like, you know, drive on the points. You can contribute to the Linux OS, but for um, the Windows OS, it's like a closed source project. You cannot contribute to it. Um, okay. So now why, why open source? Like, why should you contribute to open source? What is what or what use is it to you as a developer, as a designer, as a technical PM? 
or you know, a customer support person as well. How does it help your career? First, it improves your technical skill. You know, um, in my experience, I started contributing to open source three months into writing code back in 2020. And within some months, I had grown technically because I was, you know, under senior developers and they were reviewing my code and, you know, my technical experience kept improving, right? So another thing is you get to turn your idea to reality. So let's say, for example, let's go back to when the Linux OS was made. Linux Torvald, I, I think I read that it was a hobby project and, you know, it was something he was interested about. And I think at that time, um, there was like, you know, a, a closed source software and he now had to like make his own part, which was open source, which helped a lot of people, right? So you see that um, Linus Torvald was able to turn his idea into reality and so many so many um, systems in the world depend on Linux, right? Which is very interesting. So another thing is like teamwork and collaboration, and that's like the heart of open source, right? You get to you get to network, you get to work with people that are like minds with you, collaborate, and collaboration is done like on a global level, it's not just within your local space. You get to collaborate on a global level, right? You get to contribute to worldwide projects. There are some persons that are, you know, members of the Linux Foundation. They didn't even know they were not born when Linux was created, but they are members of the Linux Foundation. So you get to teamwork and collaborate. Another thing is transparency. Um, you know, with, with open source, when you create like open source projects, the project is transparent. Like I said, the code is publicly accessible. Everybody can see it. So if there's a problem, if there's like an inconsistency, maybe the code is not looking correct, or like somebody can spot it because it's transparent and, you know, they can try to fix it. So another thing is helping others learn. It helps, you can help others learn as, you know, in your career, during your career span, you can mentor others, there's room for mentoring, there's a whole lot of things, right? And another thing, we are in the festival, everybody's learning here, right? That's uh, because we are, we are coming together for an open source festival. So these are some of the things that, you know, why you should contribute, these are some of them. So, um, so the big question for like this workshop is, what kind of projects um, can be open sourced, right? Because most of the time when you say open source, a whole lot of people think code, software, right? Um, we still have some designers that do not think they can contribute to open source. So what type of projects can be open sourced? Code projects, I'll start with code because I'm a developer. So code projects, right, software projects, design files, design systems, you are a designer. I, naturally, I feel everything can be open source too. Like even articles, your processes, right? So everything can be, you can open source your process of doing things, you can open source, you know, your design system, you can open source your website, you can op open source documentation, um, a whole lot of things, like the, the margin is very wide. So I hope you know that you can look at everything. So, um, so let's go into steps. This is like the workshop time. Nobody with their laptop. That is with their laptop. Okay. I see one person. I'll be looking at the person throughout because she's the only one with a laptop. Okay. So before we go into that, let's, let's, let's look at this. Sorry. I don't think we see. Post-trade checklist, but it's not syncing. That's post trade checklist, but I'll read it out. Um, so first, what I have on this checklist is your project name and the description. Definitely, you need a name, right? It's not going to be your name, so you need a name. You need a description of what your project is going to be about. So for this, for the purpose of this workshop, I'm going to be demoing a website, a simple landing page. So that's what I'll be referencing throughout the presentation. So my project name is, I think, Oscar website, Os open source demo, something like that. So um, the second thing I have, I think they're trying to connect this back because I'm sharing. So um, the next thing I have on the checklist is a readme file. So what is a readme file? For persons that are familiar with GitHub, you know what a readme file is, but I'll, you know, try, I'll, I'll be inclusive. So um, a readme file is a file that details, you know, when I 
said the first thing, you have a project name and then you have a description. So the second thing is the readme file that will go in detail. So the description can be, you know, one or two lines to like a summary of what the project is about. But now the readme file, it will go into details of what your open source project is about, to go into um, key details like how, if it's like a website or a software, how so people can get started with it, how they can um, find where to contribute, where they can find this. So you have like a detailed, detailed description of the readme file. So the next thing I have on my checklist is a license. So let's talk about licenses. Okay, yeah, so this is it. So um, let's talk about um, licenses. Now, um, when you create like, when you do creative work, you, cop you have copyright access to it, right? Um, you know, it's your creative work, so you, you are the owner of it, basically. And licensing in open source allows you to maintain that status. Now, there are two, there are two distinct licenses. Like, all these licenses, they help you, you know, tell what a user can use that project for or not. So there are two Dixon licenses. So we have, I'm going to be, um, demonstrate it again. So we have copyleft licenses and we have permissive licenses. Uh, let me go into detail. Now, copyleft licenses, they are restrictive, right? So they, they tell, the, the licenses details what a user can do or cannot do with that project. If you, if you go back to my definition of open source, the four things I talked about, these two licenses still cover that. But now, these other permissive licenses are like licenses that allow you to, even when the project is open source, can use it for a proprietary work, right? So let me give a, I feel this example is relatable, so let me give this example. So we have React, how many of you know React or have heard of React? Everybody should have now, they run the world, so. I feel I'm, I'm, I feel I'm betraying Python right now, as I said that, but that's fine. Um, so React is an open source, you know, library, the front end library. So now we have React. React now, if you go to GitHub, you'd see, if you check the license, React is an open source project, right? If you go to GitHub, if you check the license, you see it's an MIT license. If you want to check that right now, you can just, you know, check it, but still be listening though. Um, so you check that it's an MIT license, and MIT licenses fall under permissive licenses. Now, if you, now let's use Linux, I'm coming back to Linux again. The, the license for Linux is the GNU license, um, GNU GPL, general public license, and that falls under copyleft license, which is restrictive. Now, for Linux pro projects, if you create a distro from Linux, that license that is there, that's what you replicate in your project, right? It's, it's restrictive in that manner. And now for React, there are so many um, proprietary owners that use React for their, for their project or for their website or for their software, right? React will not come and hook you on the neck. Okay, you collected my code, and now it's now, nobody can see it. React is not going to come and hook your throat, right? They, they won't sue you because it's a permissive license, right? So um, if you can see, I, I kind of did like a color code there. Um, MIT, so MIT and the Apache license, they fall under permissive licenses. There are a whole lot of them, they're like, they're plenty. So, um, so MIT and Apache license, they fall under like um, permissive licenses. So the GNU and Mozilla public license, they fall under like the copyleft licenses, right? So they are kind of like restrictive. So you need a license in your open source project. So you have to decide, okay, um, the project I'm going to be um, creating, do I want um, someone else to use it and, you know, and it's going to be restrictive. You can't do, you can't make proprietary code out of it or do I want to be a giver and, you know, allow everyone to do what they want with my project. So you have to make that decision for yourself. So then you have like a code of conduct. Um, this code of conduct is just detailing what, like, it's detailing behavior. It's helping you track behavior, you know, what um, to maintain, especially when you have a community, because some, some people, I know there was this time um, with Oktoberfest, I think that was 2021, where um, 
The October Fest was going on, and so many people were creating random pull requests up and down, like something like they just want to change a letter. And there was no issue for that. So GitHub had to do, like, I think they had to um, give some um, rules as regards October Fest at that time. So now code of, your code of conduct has details like that that would say, okay, um, you can't do this. If you do this, you are going to be something, something like that, right? So that's for the code of conduct. Um, then lastly, a contributing guide. Now, I want to put a disclaimer here. You must not create an open source project for others to contribute. If you just want to open source your project and just leave it there, you don't want contributors. No, no problem, right? But you, you can also create a contributing guide if you want others to contribute. Because they are new to your project, they, they need to know how to help you, basically. They need to know where, you know where and where to help you, how to come in, how to create issues, how to signal you when there's a bug, all those, all those kinds of things. So you have that in the contributing guide. So that's the checklist. There are, there are a whole lot of other things, but these are the most important things because like, they are so important to read me because it's, it gives detail to your project and it gives meaning to it. So you should always have like, this checklist in mind when you're creating like, an open source project. So um, for the person that has their laptop, let's start. Um, so the first thing, so also a disclaimer here. It's not just GitHub that you can put your open source project. Because I'm wearing a GitHub shirt, I'm a GitHub size, not, not just GitHub, right? You can, there's GitLab, you can also have it as a document. It must not be on GitHub if you're not familiar with GitHub, right? But for the, um, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm just going to be using GitHub to do that. So the first step, we are going to be creating a repository. Yep, it is working, but yeah, it's working out. Okay, so, um, so the first step is, like I said, I'm using um, GitHub for this example. The first step is creating a repository. So I'll go to the plus button and the new repository. So like I said, I'm going to be calling this open source demo. Are you pulling? Is there any other person with their laptop? So I give you a thumbs up. Are you pulling? Um, so I'm going to be calling this open source demo, open source project demo rather. I'm just going to call this open source project for this sort of time. So like I said, this is a GitHub, it's a landing page. So like I said, this is a landing page. So that's the description there. That's what I'm putting right now. So you have the description for it. Yeah. So we have this. Basically, what Then, so GitHub has you know a very so you can add a readme from here. Sorry, you can add a readme from here. So I'm just going to click add readme and it's going to automatically add a readme file. And I said the readme file is what gives like um, you know in depth details of your project. So I add the readme file. Then you see under place the add choose a license. Right, GitHub allows you pick, there's like a drop down. So if you click on choose a license, you can see there's a drop down there. You know, I can choose. So I'm going to be using the MIT license. So I pick MIT, MIT license and create repository. So yeah, I've created, I've created this repository, right? So let's go back to the checklist. We have, we have um, the readme there. Okay, we have a project name. We have a project description. This is a landing page. And then we have the readme file. We have the license. That's the MIT, MIT license, the permissive license. So the next thing on that is the contributing.md file. So the contributing file that details how um, folks will contribute to your project and all that stuff. 
So I have the file already in here in my computer. So I'm just going to add it. So add file. I'm going to upload the file. Choose your files. So I have the contributing.md file. Right. I add that. And another thing again is the um, code of conduct, right? I talked about. So GitHub, um, GitHub allows you add a code of conduct. They have like a template for you to add, but I've already downloaded that to my laptop. So whenever you do that, there's a template to add a code of conduct. Mm -hmm. This went off, but yeah, I'm trying to add the code of conduct now to the repository. So I've added two files right now. What up? Are you good? Because why are the people following me? They're not even interested. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so I have um, code of conduct. Yeah. Oh, I have code of conduct. I have the contributing.md file. So I'm going to commit changes. Um, so I'm going to call this added checklist. Mm -hmm. Added checklist. So I'm, for the case of this project, I'll just commit it directly to main branch. I think there was a Git and GitHub workshop that bothered you to go if you're there, you can get more details about branches in GitHub and Git. So added checklist and commit changes. Okay, so we have our checklist full. Um, are you good, Favor? Okay, yes. okay cool. So um, we have the checklist ready. So the next thing, so I go back to the slides. So we have our checklist, we have crossed our checklist. Um, the next thing is to import your code, your file, you know, if it's a design system, to so import it. I have that already in my laptop. I didn't want to go through the GitHub Git process. So I have that already in my laptop. So I add file. Um, I have like an index.html file and a CSS file together. So I'm going to add those two files right now. Um, upload file. I have the index.html. So I'm adding, I'm, at this point, I'm adding the code or you know design pattern depending on what you're adding to the repository. I'm adding the next one, which is the CSS file. If you want to do that, but you can just add maybe a random file for, for, for the meantime. If you can't do that immediately, you can just like sure. add a random file. So I have added the code, the index, the HTML file, and the CSS file that contains the code for my landing page. So I commit changes. So I have so I have the code, I have all my important files on the checklist. Um, even though it's not arranged, you can arrange yours later, you know, put them in file order and make it more beautiful. So I have added the code. And you know, when you're adding the code, depending on what you're doing, you need to make sure that you know you don't have secret keys open, you know, things that you know might might cause security risks. You don't have that open. You need to make sure that your code is clearly documented, you know, write comments, you know, you need to make sure that there's no sensitive information in your code. So you need to make sure of all those things when you are uploading this because it's public, right? If anybody, like if you if you go on GitHub now and search for this repository, you're going to see it. You can open everything. So you have to be careful. And that's it, right? So you can keep adding things, right? You can keep adding files, you know, modifying the project. But that's the basic structure for creating an open source project. It's that simple. So um, now I'm going to talk about um, some finishing touches, you know, something relating. I'm going to talk about. Um, branding and you know marketing practice, best practices for your project because when you have the projects you, if, if it's just there especially when you want to contributors if it's just there nobody will see it or 
nobody can contribute to it. So I'm going to talk about you know a few branding tips and marketing best practices. So when you're um, when you're naming your projects, you have to avoid name conflicts. Everybody creates if like projects randomly. People name things. People buy domains. So you have to be sure there's no name conflict because if your project goes far, it's going to be very hard to come and correct these things. So be sure, I think there's a website where you can check, I think it's initial domains or something. You can check for like name conflicts, be sure that you know it's not clashing with any other projects. You also need to be sure that your publications are error free, you know, proving facts, don't put things that lies. So um, you need to make sure of that. You also need a style guide or something like a blueprint or a roadmap for your project. So you need to plan the project. You're the owner of the project. And you ha yes, you have contributors that you are going to probably collaborate with and make things better. But then you need, you need a blueprint first so that um, contributors coming in would have a sense of direction. So you need to create a style guide or a blueprint or even a roadmap to guide contributors. So for marketing, talking about your project, so creating it and keeping it there, although you can publicly search for this, people might not see it. So you have to share it on social media. This is a website I created. Um, it's open source, you can check it out. So open source um, sharing, creating open source projects is not necessarily so that other people, it's not just other people contributing. People can also make comments on your code that probably it's not, it's not working well or people can make comments can contribute and do all that stuff um, you also need to create detailed issues so there's these labels for github github has issue labels where you can label projects and say for example first timer only label good first issue so it helps you it helps um, other contributors find your project easier so if i go to let me show you something if i go to the explore page on GitHub, and I randomly search good first issue. That's, let me just see. So I'm trying to search. So you can see there are like six, 687 repository results with the label good first issue. And if I'm a contributor and I'm looking for a good first issue to contribute to, I can go here and these are public projects. And I think almost all of them are under MIT license. So you, I can go there if I'm a contributor. I can find your project from nowhere, right? And contribute to your project. So that's why you need to add those um, detailed issues. You know, create, add labels and properly say what you want to be done. Say for example, there's a bug in the landing page not aligning well, I don't know how to do CSS, it's not aligning well, right? Detail the issue, how can the person help? So you have to like put proper details about that. So uh, another, another tip is creating a community and it's not by force. If you want the open source project to just be there, you must not create a community, but you know, a community strengthens an open source project and takes it far. So you can choose to create a community or not also can partner with you can partner with like um, other communities to market your open source projects you know, collaborate with other communities tell them about your project in slack groups i know there are like some slack groups community developer slack groups or even um, designer slack groups you can market your products or your projects rather and you know get other persons community advocates as well open source community advocates to talk about your project and put it out there so that's basically it. That's all you have to do and your open source project is ready. So I'm going to take questions now. So Favor and, what's your name, sorry? Hmm? Kenny, okay, Favor, Kenny. You are following, right? Okay, so um, they're all good, right? On the project demo, cool. So I'll take questions right now. Is there any questions? Roots. Yeah. 
So um, it was quite a very simple um, workshop. Uh, but I think there was a, there's a part that I was not that I was cut off, but I, was, I should have seen like um, what, what, when do we choose to upload a file, or when do we choose to create? You know, on Git on on the, on your profile is where you can upload or create. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, good question. So it depends if you have the file because I had the files in my local, like in my computer. That's why I was uploading. So if I wanted to like you know do it hands on and just write up, say you want to create a file and you have everything in your head and you want to just write it out. So you can now create a file, but because I had everything in my laptop, I just uploaded the files. Did I answer your question? Yeah, you, I saw something like a Git, GitHub star or something like that. So what does it mean to be a GitHub star and how can you be a GitHub star? Okay, good question. So what, so GitHub stars are, are folks that, so they are, Keywords influence, educate, um, inspire. Do I inspire anybody here? Yeah, so um, inspire, educate, influence, other de like developer communities. So what it takes to mainly be a GitHub star is, so those, they are the ones that review. So someone, it's an open process. Someone goes up to GitHub, there's a link, and then they nominate you for, to be a GitHub star, and on their end, GitHub, you know, makes, sends you an email, you, they, they review your profile, you know, check. So if you're doing these things, if you're um, on the community side, you're educating people. Um, I know Solomon talked about technical writing. That's one way to like educate um, developer communities and other tech communities as well. So if you're doing these things, if you're influencing, if you're giving like, public speeches, speaking at conferences. So if you're doing those things, they check your profile. And you know, if you are, if it's, they send you an email and there's a process. So did I answer your question? Okay. Cool. Any other question? Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. I want to ask, what's the difference between you adding your file directly and you going through what is Git in it, Git out, all these things? Yeah, great question. So the difference is there are some restrictions. Um, I can add all these things directly, but sometimes there are some restrictions. For example, if you want to contribute to an open source project, some open source projects would need you to sign a, so there's something they call developer certificate of origin, you know, to sign that you are the person, you are truly the person writing this code, right? So um, some communities who involve you to sign that, I can't sign that on GitHub. So there are some restrictions. So usually for developers, please use Git. Not that I do not use Git, but please use Git to do that. Cause like, although sometimes you can run into errors, but it's a better process. Did I answer your question? Okay, so you mentioned that this is a beginner, you know, for beginners. So what are the other things we need to learn? Are they, do we need to learn how to operate on GitHub? Then when someone is contributing to my project, how will I know? Because you said it's for beginners and some of us are beginners, beginners, okay. so. I'm so sorry. Okay, so for beginners, beginners, you need you need a GitHub account first. If you are going to use GitHub, right? You're going to use GitHub. So I'm, 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 I'm sensing you are using GitHub. You want to use GitHub to do this, right? So let me explain from that point, right? Okay. Yeah. So if you're going to use GitHub, you need a GitHub account. And you know, when you have an account, if you have a repository and someone makes any action on it, you're going to be notified via your email because then you add your email when you're creating like your profile, you add like your email. So if someone creates, so how people notify you is when they, when they create um, a, when they create a repository, sorry, when they create an issue rather, when they create a comment on your issue, when they create a, a PR, you're notified via your email. So that's how you know how to know what comes into your project. So that's how you track those things via your email. You always get a notification. And even for other persons that 
you know, and like you're not the owner of the project, if you want to get notifications, I do not advise anybody to do this actually because you're going to get a lot of notifications. So you can watch the repository. I know it's not showing. So there's a part where you can watch the repository. And once you watch it, yeah, so it's up now. So you can see that part where the cursor is. You can watch this repository and any any pull request, anything that happens on the project, your email is going to like be full. I think I did that one time and I woke up the next morning and I had like so many emails and I was wondering what was happening. So I, I necessarily accept you want to watch the project and know details about it. Um, so another thing is, so after you create like the projects, you have the GitHub account to create your project. You are a maintainer of the project. So you are the, so maintainer is in this sense means owner of the project. Right, so you have access to everything. You can now um, share, maybe if you have a community, if you want to create a community, you want to accept contributors, you can now share access to some certain contributors that might be your core contributors. So I hope I'm not going too far. Okay, cool. So um, you want to give access to some persons. You now, so with that, remember I said you need like a blueprint or like a roadmap. So with your roadmap, you keep planning or if you're doing it solely, you keep planning alone or with your core contributors and keep taking the project a step further and putting it out there, more contributors coming. They, are, they, are, they, are, they will get to a point where you want to give maintainer access to other contributors that are now core contributors. You give them maintainer access. People keep improving how the project looks like and just keeps be getting better. Sometimes, you know, people will now, um, you know, clone your own projects make something out of their own, depending on your license. So that's how the step keeps going and keeps getting better. Did I answer your question? Um, hi. So for someone who is new to the open source, how do you suggest we find projects that we can contribute? Like for instance, you search for um, first pull requests or something. How do you find um, repositories and open source projects that we can contribute to for a start? Thank okay, you. cool. So I'm sorry, just keep stay with the microphone. I'll talk to so you. You're a developer, right? Yes. Okay, you write React or yes. don't don't be scared, don't worry. <laughs> don't be scared. So you write React. Yes. Okay, so let's let's look for a project. So usually there's this tag I use to find projects on GitHub. So we are going to the explore page again. So it's loading. Okay. Cool. So you go to this part, the global search, and you do label. Remember I talked about issue label. So label, sorry, I have to drop this and type up the Type up the rather. Um, label. Label, something to bring like so your search is going to be streamlined to pull to issues right so is issue the colon then we want the search that comes up to not so the issue should not be assigned to anybody so you don't want things that people have been assigned to do you know assignee So now let's make this global search. Sorry. So now you see we have just one issue with these specific labels. This is actually a, a Spanish project or something. But you can keep adding more labels and you know find more issues and you know contribute more. So okay, let's just remove good first issue. I think that's the problem here. Let's remove good first issue because, like I said, many people do not use these labels. So sometimes you can. So you see, we have 8,000, over 8,000 issues. So now you, you just have to keep searching and you know, pick what you want to contribute to. So this is one way, right? Then you can also search projects by, you can search projects on explore page, I think GitHub has a list. 
you can search by topics. Um, you can search trending. If you want to contribute to the trending ones, collections as well. That's something important. Oscar has an open source project. Like they have made in Nigeria. Yeah, they have a list of open source projects. You can check there as well. Um, you can check. You can check for so for first timers, for beginner beginners. So so first timers only. So yeah, so for first timers, you know, you can check this website and there are a lot of first contributions. There are so many things. You see there's a particular site called Good First Issues. I can find issues as well. So there are like a lot of resources here. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Can, you, can you also share the link on your schedule page so that people mm. can have access to it? Okay. So you can just Google first timers only in case I'm not able to share the link. Any other question? I see somebody there. Thank you for the for the presentation. Okay. I I would like to ask. I okay. understand that one very important component of an open source project is the license. Mm -hmm. So can you please share with us either resources or general idea on picking the correct license? Yeah, thank you for your question. I have a resource slide as well, like a slide that details. You can go for, you can Google um, open source. You can, let me check the domain, let me know. So let me just show the resource slide. So I have a resource slide here, um, open source license. So you can check opensource.org slash licenses. There's like a whole lot of detail about licenses. There are like so many licenses, even me, I'm confused sometimes. <laughs> but I was able to explain the main ones or the popular ones per se. So you can check um, opensource.org slash licenses and read more. They are like, on that, on that website, there are like a lot of questions, people asking questions about licenses that you can also learn from. So you can check that out. Did I answer your question? Yes, you do. Thank you. Hi, I'm IADG. I'm a product designer. So, nice to meet you. Um, you talked mainly about um, programmers and uh, uploading their codes and stuff. But you said when you started that even designers can create open source projects. Mm -hmm. So my question is, um, when I am like creating my project, do I like upload my like let's say my Figma file in the place of where you uploaded your HTML and CSS? Yeah, you can do that as well. But I think, correct me, designers, there's like a lim there's like a limit to the kind of file you can upload on GitHub. I think it has a limit. Perry, it has a limit, right? Like the file you can upload on GitHub, the amount of files you can upload, design files. So like the the yeah the size rather for GitHub, like to upload design files on GitHub. I think there's a limit. <laughs> yeah, so I think there's a limit. There, sh there might be a limit, but you can, um, you know, upload your design files as well. You know, but you know, arrange them, title them, give them structure. Yeah, you can upload your design files. Thank you. Sorry, Perry, for calling you out. Um, any other question? Yeah, how do you get access to this? I didn't have a link like Solomon. But I'll, I'll share this in Discord, Oscar Discord. If you're not there, you're supposed to be there, so I'll share it there. Any other question? Okay. I think the mic. Thank you. You said something about GitHub has a um, code of conduct. How do we access that? Okay, let me quickly show that because GitHub has like a template for code of conduct. Let me just. Okay, sure. 
So let me try to add another file and show you that. Let me try to upload. Because I already um, has this, I had like the code of conduct already, so I just uploaded it. So let me try to add another file. Okay, yeah, so so I add another file. If I want to, let's, I, I want to add, let's say the code of conduct is not there. And I want to add a code of conduct. So if you create a new file, say code of conduct. So I've created, okay. Now you see by this side, because I typed code of conduct, you see that there's choose a code of conduct template, right? So if you click that, you now want to choose which, what kind of, so there are two here, contributor covenant, citizen code of conduct, so you can choose which one. So let's say I want the contributor covenant code of, and you can read through it as well, so you know the differences between them and, yeah, so review and submit. So we have this here. Everything has been added here already. And then you commit changes. Sorry, it has a placeholder, so it, it will put that create code of conduct. So yeah, so you have created under file code of conduct. So GitHub has that template, so you don't have to like go do so much research about it. Did that answer your question? Any other question? No, okay. Um, All right, well, thank you for the speech. Thank so, you. Um, like he said, the product designer, how that he can upload his Figma um, stuff on GitHub. So as a data scientist or a data analyst or a machine learning engineer, apart from technical writing and I just want to know what other way can we contribute to open source? Um, because we know that um, machine learning engineers, they deal with um, algorithms that make predictions and some companies or organizations may want to hide their, their, their algorithms that um, help them make better predictions. So how can we contribute to open source that way? Just a thought. This question is quite tricky. So there's a company that has um, machine learning algorithms that are hidden, right? If I'm getting it correctly. Yeah. And you want to contribute to that company. Is that your question? Apart from um, technical writing, what other ways? What other ways apart from technical writing? Organizing events. There are, there are volunteers here that are, that, that plan these events. So organizing events is one way to, is a very good way to, contribute to open source, like you're here learning. And this, this festival was organized by volunteers, people that came together and did this, right? So they planned everything. They planned the venue, they planned food, they planned, they reached out, outreach, you know, there was a lot of sponsors. They did all that stuff. So organizing events is another way to contribute to open source. You're not okay. Okay, so you have to take question again, so I don't, Okay, I'm talking about as a machine learning engineer, as a data scientist, how do you contribute to it? I'm, okay, so should we come and serve food here? You don't want to contribute code. You don't want to contribute code. Is that what you're saying? Not necessarily code. You don't want to contribute code. Yes. Hmm. Or even, if, even code, I mean, apart from, that's what I was saying about companies that want to have, that want to hold their, or want to keep their algorithms safe. So if, if the company wants to keep their algorithms, it's not an open source project. Like, I, I talked about, like, key, so you should remember this, that the, the code is available, the design pattern, everything is publicly accessible. Not like the secret keys are going to be open, right? Those um, credentials won't be open, but the design pattern is going, so if the company is not, okay, if the, if the um, company's 
code is not available or they want to hide that it's not an open source project right so you should take note of that when you're contributing did i answer you that's fine so, yeah, i think So, um, as a beginner on uh, GitHub, how do you get to create or add a new project to your GitHub account? How Can do you, you add projects yes, to GitHub? Yes, a new project. Can you do, like, demonstrate? Hmm. Internet so, I have to connect the game just give me a second. You want me to show that, right? Sorry. Okay. So I want to show you how to create a new project. Where are you here from the start? Okay, that's right. So this is my GitHub account, so I'm a new contributor. So if I want to create a new repository, go to that plus sign, plus sign, then new repository, and then you do the name, you add a description, you make it public, you add a readme, and you add a license, and you create your repository. Did that answer your question? Any other questions? I think I have two more minutes. So that's one. Yeah, your voice is clear. So I was talking about name conflicts, right? So you don't want to say I have this project called open source project demo, and then you name your own same thing. I'm the first person. Yeah, where do you find? So on, I have a resource slide, and again, I'm going to share the slide on the Discord. I have a resource slide, and it has the readme template. You know, where to find the readme template in case you're, you do not know how to create a readme. You, you can check open source guide. There are a whole lot of resources, everything I've talked about, licenses. So um, at this point, thank you for listening to my talk and enjoy your lunch. Give it up, give it up.